All right. Um, it's three o'clock now. Um, let's get going because we've got quite a bit to cover. Um, and so I applaud you all for making it uh, this late in the day on the last day and especially finding your way down the uh, tunnel system to get here. Uh, I'll be honest, I almost got lost on my way here too. Um, so first off, um, we've all been there. Um, you get a call from a client mid project and they tell you there's been some changes. There's been some changes in the business, there's been some changes in management, there's been some changes that are coming down the pipeline. And you instantly know that this can only mean one thing, the pivot, right? And so everybody knows the feeling of the pivot, right? And the pivot is the truest test of the client and um, uh, agency relationship. It brings the changes um, from the business, uh, from the budget, um, maybe even the staff involved, all of that comes together. And then how you manage these pivots is what strengthens your relationship with the client. And so today, as we're talking about uh, design systems, documentation, uh, discovery, um, all of it is built around the idea of how can we use these tools before we ever start coding um, the actual website to build relationships um, that can form uh, a strong bond and last through those pivots. Uh, I'll give you an example of a pivot that we went through and you can see kind of why we did what we did through this. Uh, we had a client that we were working with. Uh, we had just won a large project with them to redo their entire website and they give us a call and they say, we just got acquired. So our whole brand is changing. So everything that we thought we were gonna do completely tossed out the window. We said, all right, we'll work with you. We worked all the way through it, launched the website, big success. And a few months later they say, hey, we got divested and now we're back out as a different brand, um, completely separate. And we had to pivot yet again, um, the website, but actually had to split the website in two. Um, one to keep part of the brand uh, at the, the company that was acquired or where the acquisition occurred, and then the other one at the, the spinoff. And so all of a sudden we're having to move systems, we're having to move websites, um, but we did it flawlessly. And the, the client was very impressed with how we did it, and it was solely because, A, we have a really good team um, that's strong and able to do this, but the second reason is that team implemented a lot of what I'm gonna talk about today. And if you have some of these uh, things in place, those type of pivots become a no, it's not a big deal. And if you can give that reassurance to the client, um, they trust you even more and they'll, they'll bring you more business. So uh, today we're gonna talk about design systems. What is a design system? What isn't a design system? For those, uh, real quick raise of hands. How many people know what a design system is? Awesome. How many people have implemented a design system? Good, I like that. Um, so we're gonna talk not only about the design systems, but the process, like who's involved, why are they involved, what should they be doing? Um, documentation, everyone's favorite thing to do, I know. Um, but we're gonna talk a bit, uh, bit about documentation. And then we're gonna get into discovery. Um, and the reason why I put discovery in here, and um, oh, did we lose? And we're back, all right. Um, one of the reasons why we're gonna talk about discovery is the, um, the idea of how can you take a design system, the documentation and everything that we're gonna talk about and wrap it into paid discovery. Not free discovery, paid discovery. And we're gonna talk about that process. And then lastly, uh, for agency owners or those that are involved in an agency, how can this uh, be utilized to grow your agency? And I can tell you kind of how we did it with ours. So, um, you may be wondering, who is this guy? Why is he up here talking to me? Um, my name is Chris Teitzel. I founded Cellar Door uh, back in 2009. We're now a 20 plus person agency. Um, and through that, we've also created a product. We just acquired a marketplace for freelancers. Um, we've been doing a bunch in the space and working with a, a variety of clients, everything from very small startups, uh, small educational uh, institutions, all the way to some of the largest businesses in the world. And um, I've been very fortunate and able to do that. Um, if you want to find me on Drupal.org, Cellar Door, uh, if you want to tweet at me or exit me or whatever they call it now, post or uh, whatever it is, uh, Tech Nerd Teitzel uh, on, on the Twitters. So, uh, design system. What is a design system and why does it matter? So, um, first, before we get into what is a design system, let's talk about what a design system is not. Um, a design system is not just components. Components are part 
of a design system, but they're not the whole thing. Uh, and so if you have a component library, congratulations, you're on the path to having a design system, but don't stop there, all right? Um, and so the next thing that I hear people say is, well, I've got a brand guide, right? I've got a logo and colors and all that, and that's, again, a step in the right direction, but you're not quite there. Um, and then the last thing is complex. A design system does not have to be complex. And so um, as you look at design systems, as you look at well-formed design systems, a lot of the times people look at that and say, there's no way I could ever build that. That thing is huge, it's a lot of time, it's a lot of effort. And yes, a design system is a lot of moving parts. Um, this is from, uh, if you've uh, heard of Brad Frost, uh, he's one of the ones that came up with Atomic Design. Um, really great guy and has dove into design systems. This blog post here is like a master class in design systems, complete with Figma links that then have all of these diagrams. If you are doing design systems, check that post out. Even if you think you know design systems, you probably don't after this because it's just so much information. But what he does here is he lays out the different parts of the design system and how a design system continues to evolve because you have to have your core design system. From your core design system, you have to have technology-specific implementation, recipes, recipes are what he calls components, right? All the different base pieces that are now put back together into a recipe. Uh, smart components are, are dependent on where they're at the technology that they're involved, and then again, you've got the product, the end result. Uh, but then uh, he's also a very big advocate of that the product actually feeds back into the system. It's not just a one-way system, it's an ecosystem. It's a centric um, cycle that you have to go through because the design system is a breathing, living thing. It can't just become stagnant. So, um, and this quote from the blog post, I think is, is really critical as we start to look at what a design system is. Uh, he said, it's critical for a design system architecture to be only as complex as it needs to be um, and just add additional layers of complexity when the real need arises for it. And I think this is awesome because I had the opportunity to work with Brad on a design system that was highly complex, many moving parts, many technologies and all that. And at first it scared me. I was like, holy cow, like there's no way we're going to be able to implement this for, you know, our, our smaller client that's not you know, this massive um, international conglomerate. And it's not true. Um, you can work towards a design system on any project, and we'll go into why you want to do that. And so um, let's start talking about what a design system is. A design system at its essence is a common agreement of all parties from design to development uh, and on how the brand is going to be presented um, to the user, to um, the consumer, wherever that may be on the technology. Um, it's a, a group of technical implementations and recipes to speed up development. I know that I kind of worded it just for um, clickbait or whatever to say, you know, all this stuff before you code, actually you're going to do some coding in the design system, but you're going to be doing it external to what you're doing uh, as you actually start to implement the website. Um, and then one thing that I love to have in a design system is a glossary of all the terms that are going to be used. What's a card? What's a button? What's a pop-up? Some people call them all sorts of different things, right? Widget A, widget B. And if you, if you have a design system that has all of this specific verbiage in it and somebody new comes in, they're going to be just completely lost. So we like to have a glossary in there as well to help people guide through it. Um, it also allows um, companies to be agile in their marketing and their branding and their presentation across a whole wide, marine, uh, wide range of mediums. And so we've implemented a design system for a company that had um, internal components, had external, uh, like in, inter, um, internet components, external components, and even hardware components all ran off of the same design system because what you're essentially wanting to build with a design system is a unified way that a consumer knows your brand. Right? So if you pick up an iPhone for those iPhone users or Android phone for the Android users, you instantly know how to use it because Apple over the years has had a consistent design system, a consistent experience that you constantly have and you know how to use it intuitively. Uh, and it's absolutely amazing if those of you that have kids that have watched this happen, you just hand them an iPad and all of a sudden just they start knowing how to use it. It's because it's intuitive. And then as they go from app to app to app, they continue to know how to use them. And that's because Apple kind of reinforces a design system like that. Um, the other thing it does is it decreases developer onboarding time um, because a developer can come in, 
load up the design system and they immediately have all the different pieces that they need to start being productive. Uh, and because of that, it actually, uh, it decreases developer onboarding time and it increases productivity because now you're not having to go back and fix the same thing across 50 different things. If all of a sudden you say, I want my buttons to have a 40 pixel rounded edge instead of a 35 pixel rounded edge because that's something that somebody somewhere had done some research on, you implement it in one place and now all your buttons are changed, right? That tone of red is too sharp, let's, let's uh, bring it down, off you go. Before design systems, I had a client that had branding change the colors on us literally every week. And so I had to write a SAS function that I called it Rainbowify, and it would just like you input thing, and it would just like spit out all these colors and then feed them into the design system or into the CSS because I was tired of writing the same thing over and over and over again. Um, this eliminates that because you have one place that everything is defined. Um, come on back to me. Sorry, I think the power is off down here. So, um, so if we look at, um, I've lost my place here. Ba -ba -ba. Okay, if you want to see like a massive design system at play, go check out IBM's Carbon. Um, it is insane. It is not only defining buttons and typography and iconography and all the different pieces and components. It's talking about where to use them, how to use them, light mode, dark mode, like. It is insane, but it's a great reference if you want to start looking at what a fully formed, um, mature design system looks like. And so um, the design system parts, I've alluded to some of these, um, but some of the design system parts uh, are going to be your brand uh, and logo guidelines, right? So colors, how to use them, where to use them, what's the spacing around the brand, all that fun stuff. It's going to include at the base level your typography and iconography, right? Uh, a lot of the times iconography is overlooked. Uh, but it's a critical part of what does the cancel button look like, right? What does the X look like? What does the check mark look like? Um, and again, because we're going for consistency in the brand and consistency in experience for the, for the customer, it's important to go all the way down to these base levels. Then you start bringing them together into common elephant, uh, elements that are defined and allow them to be arranged and rearranged. Um, and you can just kind of mix and match and create these, what Brad calls recipes, I call components. Um, and then you normally have a guide of all the components in the system, a centralized spot where everything that's going to be shown on the web is in and able to be looked at, reviewed, QA'd, tested, completely outside of the website. Um, and then last of all, um, there's going to be some rules. Where can you, where can't you um, do this, don't do that. Um, you know, if you look at carbon, it's a great example. One of the things is on dark mode, never put a, a uh, modal on dark mode that's darker than the background because you get, you get a weird contrast, right? And so there's little rules like that that if you put it into your design system, you start to understand. And it, it takes some time, but then over time, uh, that consumer experience just gets better and better and better and it's more mature, it's more consistent, and to them, it's, it's easier to use. So if we want to break down a design system, uh, I've got two sons seven and nine, and so they love Legos, right? This is their jam right now. But if you think about it, Lego is actually a really good design system. You've got the tubes and the studs, super basic, right? This is just a block. It's a big square block, and we're gonna define what this block looks like, we're gonna define what the color is, we're gonna define across all of them, they're gonna have the same studs, they're gonna have the same tubes, because they all have to click together, right? And we're not gonna change the size of tubes and studs because then the whole thing would fall apart. And if all of a sudden we had one piece out here that had a different size stud or a different size tube, they would never come back together, right? And so from that basic piece, you can create very complex things. And so one of the things we have to look at as we start talking about design systems is a lot of folks get scared of, I don't want to have a cookie cutter site. I don't want to have a cookie cutter experience. I want the freedom, right? For the artistic people in the room, you want to, you want to be this wild stallion in the field running around. You don't want to be in the corral in a pen, cooped up. You want to go live free, right? Well, a design system lets you live free with some guidelines. It lets you live free and you can create and do whatever you want, but you know, using common elements and tools, and from it you get a lot of consistency. And so um, it, it is a time commitment that I'm not saying it's not, 
Um, but then rather than focusing on the how, a design system focuses more on the what. Um, and this allows the design system to be implemented across a lot of technologies. So um, if, you're, if you're looking at a product or a client or a customer that has um, websites, apps, um, in-store displays, hardware, whatever it may be, if there's a UI, if there's something that a customer is looking at, that design system should be able to apply to it. And your goal is to be able to unify all the pieces together. Um, and because of this, like I've been talking about, consumer brands need that consistency. Uh, I've, I've experienced this before when I've used certain brands where you, you download the mobile app and you're like, that wasn't built by them. I can tell, why? Because the design is not Co coherent with what I saw on the website, right? And you're trying to get this like, it, it's disjoining in your head of like, I'm on the app and now I go back to the web and they're two different experiences and the buttons are different and like, where's the menu? Is it a hamburger up here? Is it a button down there? And because of that inconsistency, uh, a lot of the times you, you, it ends up in, in customer fall off. They'll, they'll leave because they just don't like it. And for whatever reason, sometimes they can't put their finger on it. They'll leave because they don't like the inconsistency of your design. So it is a, it is a time commitment. Um, and, uh, but the, on the opposite side, um, what it does do is it gives developers and designers equal say. Now I'm gonna talk about that more here in a minute, but, but let me reaffirm re that. Designers, developers are equal footing in a design system. Um, and because they're equal footing, they've all had some voice in the process um, they all have buy-in now. And, and those of you that run teams and have managed before, you know that if you can get the team to, to participate in what's going on rather than just follow commands, they have buy-in. They're now invested in it because they've personally made a decision and now they're gonna be more willing to, to work within it and work with it. Um, and then last but not least, shockingly, brands change, right? Logos change, colors change, fonts, whatever it may be. Now, as you start seeing those pivots, even if they're small pivots, they're no big deal. I'm gonna change a variable here for that color. It's updated across the whole design system. We test it, we QA it, we make sure it's good to go, and off it goes. Another good point here that I didn't put on here is that with design systems, accessibility becomes so much more attainable. Because all of a sudden, if you know that that button is gonna have this alt text behind it, or that image is always gonna be defined in this way, or the ARIA labels are in a certain, um, certain way on this component, every time that component's used, you know it's gonna be consistent. You know you're gonna have it, right? It's not up to each page or each developer to remember, oh, I need to put this back there. So as things change, you can, you can roll with the punches, you can roll with the changes and actually um, you know, work with your clients and they're, they're freaking out because they've got all these changes and marketing came down with all this and you're like, no, it's fine, I've updated it, go look at the website, and it's right there. It almost feels like magic at times. So um, let's get into who's involved. So surprise, surprise, in a design system, we're gonna need designers. Uh, any designers in the room? All right, thanks for coming. Um, so designers, we need you, we want you. Um, developers, nerds, where you at? Nerds, all right. Good job. Um, what nerd doesn't want to be in control, right? So you get, you get a say in the design system. Uh, stakeholders, um, management, C-suites, muffy mucks, all right? Um, you guys have a role in the design system as well because you need to be able to um, get involved and know what the different pieces are gonna be. Uh, marketing folks, any marketing in here? Nope, all right. <laughs> uh, but the marketing folks are just as important and we'll get into that here because they're actually the ones who are held accountable for what the design system does. Uh, and then last but not least, PMs, project management, uh, cat herders, we cannot work without you, so thank you very much. Um, you're expected to guide the whole process and get us from point A to point B, so it's critical that you're involved in that design system process as well. So first off, the designers. Um, one of the things, I'm sorry for those designers, I have to say this, you're not better than anybody else in the design system. You are part of the team, you're part of the design system, but you're not the god of the design system, okay? Let's take a moment and just process that, let's understand that, and move on, okay? So, um, you have an equal footing as everybody else, 
sometimes you're the origin of it, right? It's, it's your brainchild, it's your artistic flow, and that's great. And sometimes marketing is gonna come to you and be like, I want a cat that's gonna like jump across the page and like grab a button, can you do it? And you have to figure out, how do I make this actually look right, right? So, um, so sometimes you're gonna be coming up with the cat grabbing the button, and sometimes you're gonna be asked to implement a cat grabbing a button. Um, but you're also responsible for considering both the UI, the interface, what are they clicking on, what does it look like, but also the UX, and this is critically important. The experience, what does it look like when I click that button? You, start ha you have to start asking those questions. And, and if you're not asking them, others may be, uh, but it's critical that you're involved in that process to make sure you're, you're understanding. When I click this button, does it zoom out? Does it fade out? What does it do, right? Um, and then last but not least, please, 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 please avoid the unicorns, all right? Our job is not to be creating, just because we can, like Lego has a million different pieces, right? And they're all sorts of different shapes and colors and you've got cups and microphones and if you ever uh, build with Legos, sometimes you like take a cup and a microphone, you stick them together and you have a lightsaber and it's like, how do they do that, right? Let's stop doing unicorns, right? Like we don't wanna have a thousand components. We don't wanna have 100,000 pieces, we want to have something that's reusable and constantly uh, that we can go back to. So um, developers, um, you're the ones who bring the design system to life. Again, let's knock you off your pedestal. You're not the king in the room, you're a player, okay? But as a developer, it's your job to ensure that the design system is built leveraging reusable code. So you're in there making sure that the variables are set where they're set, we're not hard coding colors, we're not hard coding fonts, we're not doing the things that will make this thing enable to be used. Um, I recommend using Storybook, I love Storybook, uh, but there's a lot of frameworks out there that can bring all of these components and pieces together so that they can be tested in one spot. Um, the great thing about Storybook is it actually works across languages as well, so you can have web components, you can have React components, um, you can do a whole bunch of different stuff, right? And because of that, you can have, again, one, one place to rule them all, one place that has all of the technology in it, and you can build 80% of the website without ever touching Drupal, without ever touching the actual implementation to the web, you can build most of the website. So then when it comes time to build, you're good, right? Um, you work hand in hand with the designers. Again, this is one of those things where we're gonna have to come to agreements. Developers, designers, we can live together, we can work together, and shockingly, design systems allow that to occur. Um, but you work together to ensure no unicorns. Again, no unicorns. If you get anything from this section, it's no unicorns, all right? So, um, and because the designers, sometimes you get a moment of artistic inspiration and you wanna do something, a lot of the times our developers are there to say, hey, that's a unicorn. Can we just switch it to this or like take this piece and move it there? And the designer's like, oh yeah, great, right? That's the type of feedback and back and forth that designers and developers need to have. Um, some of the developers that we've experienced aren't comfortable having that voice in the room, right? They're not comfortable speaking up, especially in a large group of people. Um, a lot of the times, we like to talk to computers because they don't talk back to us. Well, most of the time they don't talk back to us, but there's a reason why developers like computers is because it just does what we say and, and we can you know, just, just be by ourselves. And so in a team scenario, sometimes the developer doesn't wanna speak up in that design system uh, conversation. So know that you have a place, know that you have a voice and you can speak up and your input is valuable, all right? So developers, let's get out of our shells, let's talk to those designers, yes, you know, they're creative and artistic and that is not what we are, but we can all work together, right? Um, let's talk about marketing. So marketing um, is in this discussion because marketing has to define um, the data back request. So marketing's the one that came and said, hey, we pulled our users, they love cats, we need a cat to grab that button, right? Because it's gonna increase ROI and we're gonna, you know, make another million dollars because of the cat grabbing a button. Um, and so they're the ones that also ensure that there's methods in place to track what that's doing. So if all of a sudden you change a button, um, what impact does that have? Right? Some of the, the bigger companies like Amazon and stuff can track if we change the size of a button or the placement of where that buy now link is, it can increase or decrease purchasing by five, 10%. When you're at scale like that, that's a lot of money, right? So there's a lot of research that goes on to that, but marketers, you're in charge of making sure that 
um, you have the ability to measure it. And you're also constantly looking towards the future, right? Designers, developers, we're living in the now, we have to build this thing. Marketers are out there looking at what's the next thing. Maybe it's not a cat grabbing a button, maybe it's dogs because dogs are you know, 2025 and we need to get into dogs. So let's start looking at that. Um, and then last but not least, as a marketer, speak up. And you're not speaking up on your behalf, you're speaking on the behalf of the customer because that's who you know. Um, project management, again, Thank you for who you are, because stuff does not get done without you. Um, I always say for agency owners, you want the best productivity boost, you want the biggest gain for your agency, hire your first PM. Like my first PM revolutionized our agency because I wasn't the one having to manage projects. I suck at managing projects. I'm not that type of person. So um, project management, you need to ensure that everyone is in the process, that they're attending the meetings, that they're there, right? But you also need to be listening to the different people and places and say, who's not talking? Let's pull them into the conversation. Let's get their, their ideas. Maybe it's that shy developer that doesn't want to talk in a group setting. As a PM, you have the relationship. You can go talk to them personally and bring their, their feedback back. Um, you're also there because you document. You live and breathe documentation, right? And so because of that, you're there scribing everything and making sure it's all written down. One of the things that we like to do is we, uh, are, and we're starting to implement this more and more, is we're not just documenting the decision, but we're also documenting why did we make that decision. Because if something underlying there changes, you can go back to the documentation and understand, they're like, why is this button blue? Why did we make that blue? And rather than being like, I don't know, or like having to go back into emails or whatever, in the documentation, in the design system, it's like, this is blue because everyone likes blue, and blue's known to be clicked on 10% more, right? That's why we, we wanna be able to document those things. So again, y'all are cat herders. You're just pushing us all towards the, the, the milestones, making sure things are done. Um, and you're coordinating and communicating um, even when folks won't do it on their own. Again, you're the voice. You're the collaboration, you are what brings it all together, you're what makes it happen. And then last but not least, stakeholders. Um, so stakeholders um, often don't get involved in the design system process, right? I like to involve the stakeholders, why? Because nine times out of 10, you get the whole thing done, you launch it, and the CEO comes in and is like, I don't like that button, can we change that button? And you're like, man, if only you were involved in the discussion on the button five months ago, we wouldn't have to go back and change this thing now, right? So stakeholders, you, you need to make sure you have an active role um, in the process. The other thing that you can do as a stakeholder is give an empowerment to your team members to let them know what they're doing is important, what they're doing is, is necessary, and let them know that they've got control. Um, if they're constantly thinking like, I don't know if I can do this, or I don't know if we should try that. That cat grabbing a button is kind of a weird thing. Um, if the CEO comes in and is like, you know what, you guys have the research to back it, I trust you, let's do this. The cat's grabbing the button, great, let's go for it, right? Um, you also hold them accountable, you're paying their checks, so you need to make sure that you're involved in the process so you can hold them accountable to what they're doing. Um, but then oftentimes the, the stakeholders are not the technical voices in the room. They're not the artists. They're not the developers, they're, they are focused on the business and they're working to make those, um, those, those business goals. Uh, but because of that, they don't have to know the underlying technology. And if your stakeholder can get in as a completely non-technical user and start clicking around and understanding what your design system does, congrats, you have a successful design system. So, next let's talk about our favorite thing in the world, documentation. So, this is really hard for me to talk about, and uh, Anna's on my team here, she knows this about me. I don't document, I can't say it right now, but I don't document a lot of stuff, right? Um, and so, but I have learned over time, slowly, that documentation matters. It matters because you have to have a reference to come back to. You have to be able to look at what's there, why is it there, um, and at times, if there's any confusion, the documentation is your guide, right? And so documentation matters. The one thing we have to realize though, is that docs aren't written in stone. They can change, right? They have to change. So let's not think that once we write a doc, we're done and we'll never go back to it. That's wrong. The documentation should constantly be living. So documentation should be clear, it should be concise, and it should be centralized. That's a new one, right? So we'll talk about that, but it should be clear, it should be concise, it should be um, 
centralized. Um, you shouldn't need a PhD in computer science to read the documentation of the project. If you do, the documentation is written for the wrong person. Um, you need to make it concise. We don't need war and peace on our design system. We don't need to like scroll to page 1,453 in order to find that reason why we made the 40 pixel button corner. That's not necessary, right? So let's make it concise, let's do it. And then it's centralized. You need to have it in a place where people can find it. So clear documentation looks like a document that's written for all parties, right? And so we like to keep documents in a place that is editable by everybody, that's accessible by everybody. And again, going back to the empowerment, everyone's empowered to update the docs. If you see something wrong, change it. Don't just say, that doc sucks, I'm not gonna do this, right? Um, go in, change it, make it different. And so um, write the document so that everybody understands. Um, and we have um, an onboarding doc for our, our company and in it is a glossary. Here's all the terms of like CMS all the way down to some of the more basic things because if you hire somebody in that's a project manager, that's awesome at project management but they've never worked in Drupal. They don't know what an entity is. They don't know what a taxonomy term is, right? And you don't want them to feel dumb having to ask this basic question, right? And so if you give them that glossary, they can, they can ease some of that pain of having to onboard into a highly technical uh, team. Um, document, again, not just the what, but the why. Why did you make that decision? What led you to that point? Um, and that allows you to have kind of a North Star to continue to go back to. Um, and then, like I said, empower your team to make those edits. If you see something, say something, right? That for those in the US, you know that term, right? But the idea here is if you see it, an error, go change it. If, uh, and, and this happens a lot of the times with onboarding documents of like, here's how to set up your local dev environment, right? Everyone's favorite thing to do. And all of a sudden, Mac releases a new update or Docker releases a new update and it completely borks everything and you have to go back and redo it make sure you update your documentation. Because if you don't, the next person's gonna come along and spend two days struggling to get their local environment spun up because the, person, the last person to do it uh, successfully didn't document the changes. Um, concise, you don't wanna have to have a TLDR for your docs, right? Like you don't wanna have this thing so long that people just try to skip to the bottom and get past it. Um, so don't make it verbose, don't make it um, hard to read, otherwise people won't. Right, and if the documentation is not used, it's worthless. Um, and so, a concise document going back to clear, it's understandable by everybody. If you feel like it's too long, chances are you don't, you're not writing it clear, and you need to go back and understand why. Um, and then the other thing is, um, if you have a table of contents, it really helps to find things, right? So have that table of contents, have a way to find things in the documents fast. One of the things that one of our team members loves to do is actually use the book module, for those of you from like old school Drupal days. Um, if you use the book module, it's great at, for writing docs that live inside the site. So then a client, whenever they're looking at their site saying, what is this component? They can actually click on a button and go in the site. They don't have to leave where they're at and they can see what is the component? What does it do? Why is it used? Where is it used? What are the rules for where it's used, right? So, and along those lines, centralized documentation. I hate, hate, hate when I have to join a project and they're like, oh yeah, the docs are over in Confluence. Great, where's all the tickets? They're in Asana. Why? Why are we using all these systems and now you're having to manage logins, you're having to make sure that every team member's on there. Oh, just go look at the docs. I don't have access to them. Why don't you have access to them, right? So don't make your team hunt for those documents. Um, we like to put them all in the same place. So if you're using Jira, use Confluence. They work well together. If you're using, uh, we like to use ClickUp. Uh, that's our tool of choice. Our docs live in ClickUp next to the tickets that are actually in ClickUp. Why? Because it's really easy for a developer to go, I'm asked to build this component, or I'm asked to change this thing. What is that thing? Why is it there? What does it look like? All those different things. Hop to the documents, find out where it's at. So now that we've gone through all of that, let's bring it all together. And please, 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 can we start invoicing for discovery? Raise a hands, who invoices for discovery right now? Awesome, keep doing it. For those of you that didn't raise your hands, do it. They're not gonna get mad at you, okay? So can I really invoice for it? Yes. We have found that the most crucial state, the most crucial part of a project 
no matter the size, the scope, whether it's $1 or a million dollars, if discovery is not done right, the whole thing's gonna fall apart. And if you do discovery right, your relationship with the client is solidified right at the beginning and you're setting yourself up for success. So what does proper discovery, um, you know, paid discovery look like? It's scoped, it's budgeted, and it's a deliverable. Um, you wanna make sure that everyone knows what they're doing what will and won't happen as part of discovery, right? Because we all have those questions of like, is this in scope, is it out of scope? Make sure that you have a clear scope, budget it, um, because it makes it valuable not only for you as an agency, right? Because you're, you're getting money for work that's being done. We all like to get paid for stuff that we do. Um, but also it makes it valuable to your client because if they're paying for it, now they have to get invested into it, right? If it's a freebie that you're, you're tacking on the side, eh, maybe I'm not gonna reply to that email right away, or like, why should I go to that meeting? If I'm paying for it, I'm gonna be at every meeting. I'm gonna make sure that I'm on every email, right? So it holds them as accountable as it holds you. And then deliverable, you wanna have something at the end of it. So what does a scoped um, discovery look like? Um, while you don't know what you're gonna build yet, um, scoping that is kind of hard. But what you want to do is scope the discovery just like you would scope anything else in your projects and make sure that there's clear outcomes. We don't know what we're gonna build, but we are gonna build a design system. We're gonna build some documentation. We're gonna understand what that looks like. And here's how much of that we're gonna do. Maybe uh, a lot of ours say we're gonna have X number of components. So we're gonna, as part of this discovery process, we're gonna build 30 components. And if all of a sudden they come to you and say, hey, I really need that cat grabbing a button, you say, that's component number 31, it's a change order, let's make sure that happens and off you go. It makes it very consistent, right? Um, it puts an expectation on the effort um, and it helps kind of size the project. So if it's a small design system, if it's a small discovery project, it's likely gonna be a small site. If it's a big discovery, like we've had close to six figure discovery projects because it's gonna be a big project. If you're spending that much up front, just to make sure you know what you're building, you, you know, it's gonna be a big project and you wanna make sure that you have that much effort up front. Um, and you can do it either by value, value or deliverable, by the hour, doesn't really matter. Um, I, one of my favorite things to say is I hate fixed bids because it ends with me hating you or you hating me. I'm doing free work or you're paying for something that I'm not doing. It puts us at odds, right? So rather I like to align myself with my clients and say, we're just gonna do this time and materials or we're gonna have clear deliverables and here's what that looks like, right? When you get into discovery, that kind of flexes a little bit because you may have like a standard discovery process that you go through. Make sure you value that. You took time to put that process together. That is your secret sauce. Don't just give that away, all right? So sometimes with discovery, it's like a base plus or something like that. You can get a little more creative with it, but please don't do fixed ever. Um, budgeted, um, you can't pay the bills with experience. Um, for those of you that are newer to development or newer to agencies and are trying to build up a small agency, one of the things you want to do is just grab that experience. If I only had that logo on my bar, I can, you know, get the next sale and, you know, I'm going to go out and I'm going to do everything for free because I just want them to like me. Newsflash, they'll pay you for it too. They're just taking advantage of your free, free time and generosity. Uh, if you give them that opportunity, most businesses will take it. So. Um, like I said, having paid discovery shows that you're taking it seriously. The client also surprisingly starts taking it seriously if they're starting to um, be asked to pay for it. Um, you'll also uh, end up with a better discovery because you're actually putting the time and effort into it. If you're not getting paid for it, you're gonna rush through it as fast as you can, right? So uh, this last thing is something that's more unique to us. Uh, we like to have our, our discovery process end with a deliverable. It's gonna have an audit, it's gonna have a slideshow, it's gonna have something tangible that the client can leave with. Um, part of that is if they're gonna pay you for it, they should have something to show for that payment, right? And it's not just a bunch of documents in your own ticketing system that they don't own, they don't use, right? So make it a deliverable, make it something that they can own. Um, and sometimes, Shockingly, during the discovery process, you realize, I don't like this client. I don't want to work with them, right? On the flip side, they might say the same thing about you, right? But if you say, hey, at the end of the discovery process, here is a deliverable, here is a roadmap, an architecture plan for how you're going to build your site, go find someone else. And you can walk away 
they don't feel like they just wasted all that money. They've got a tangible, deliverable architecture document that they can now take to another agency. And we've done this. We've given it to clients and said, you know, peace be with you, but we're not going to be here with it. Um, and on the flip side, we've been given discoverable documents uh, or deliverable discovery. And we're like, awesome. We're only going to change this, this, and this. And it took what would have been a massive, you know, two, three month long discovery process was scoped down to like two weeks because it's basically like, hey, let's review what the previous agency did. Let's make sure we're in line with it. We'll change anything we need to. Off we go. So why does this lead to agency growth? It's probably why most of you agency folks are here. Um, this is like groundbreaking. I know um, some of you don't know this, and I'm, I'm sorry that I have to be the one to teach you. If you have happy clients, your agency grows. That's how it works, right? <clears throat> so as an agency, our job is to make sure that our clients are happy. Um, if our clients are happy, they spend more money, we have more consistent con consensus, and um, we are agile. Um, we're not only agile ourselves as the, as the development team, we have agile clients. They like that. So uh, increased speed. Um, taking the time to, to up front uh, to document and design and come to that uh, makes sure, make sure that you have a clear path to finish without the dreaded refactor, right? As a developer, you're like, yeah, I can do that, but I'll have to refactor everything. Nobody likes to hear that, right? So let's get it all done at the beginning so that we're not refactoring it constantly. Um, a design system, uh, once it's created and the components are in place, <clears throat> the implementation in the CMS is really more building the Lego than actually designing the studs and tubes, right? We're just putting this thing together, right? If you ask me to make my own Death Star Lego kit, it's gonna take me months. But if you give me a booklet and some pieces, I can put that together relatively quickly, right? So, and again, proper documentation and design leads to clearer tickets, less confusion, everybody knows what they're doing, which means the clients are happy. Now, if the clients are happy, you have more consensus. You're on the same team. And with that consensus, the inevitable change um, comes up and the clients are able to say, yes, that's changed. Because in our document, we clearly stated that rounded corners are 40 pixels. You want to change them to 60 pixels, that's a change order. It's a small one, but it's a change order, right? Um, it allows you to not have that ambiguous, like, did we talk about this? Didn't we? Like, who agreed on this? Where did it come from? All of us have been there. If, you're, if you have those conversations, it doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong, but this helps eliminate a lot of those um, arguments about what's in scope, what's out of scope, because the scope was created as part of the project. Um, and then last, we're gonna have alignment on the project, uh, and it creates, because of that alignment, um, because of that alignment, we're gonna have more success in the long run. Um, and so, <clears throat> that success looks like, as an agile agency, um, you are now giving your client the ability to make their own decisions, right? I'm giving you all the Lego pieces and now I'm saying, Go, have at it. You know, you want a microsite? Go make a microsite. You want another page on your website? Don't have to talk to me, right? They love that because inevitably in their history at some point they've had a website where every single word every single image has to go to a developer it has to get a ticket i have to wait two weeks to see that thing on the page and then as a marketer i am now waiting two weeks to then have to start tracking it for another month to see if the customer even liked that thing right but if you're able to make those changes quick you you agree on them you roll it out they can start seeing it really quick or hey we've got a new product cool You've got all the pieces to put the product page together. We don't have to get involved in that. And it makes them more agile in their business. So pivots become less uh, impactful. Uh, and overall, faster releases just make that agile marketing, agile business um, something that you can start getting them into. It will change the way that they work. It will deliver results every time. And because of that, they go back to a happy client, right? They're making more money. They're making more money because of the thing that you did and they'll keep coming back to you. So let's wrap it all up and put it all together. Design systems, while intimidating at first, actually save work in the long run. So do them, take the time, invest in a design system. Make sure that everyone on your team is involved, that they're empowered, that they're given the, the ability to have say and, and a seat at the table. 
Um, make sure that you're documenting everything um, for folks like me that don't do that documentation so that I can come back to and be like, why did we make that decision or what did we talk about in the last meeting? I now have a place that I know I can go to reliably and have all that information. Uh, last, for those of you that aren't doing paid discovery, I hope that you can see that glimmer of uh, actuality that you can go start charging for discovery. And for those of you that are charging for discovery, keep going for it. We need to set that precedent in the market that this is something that is not free. This is not something that's given away because understandably, it's the most critical part of the document or critical part of the process. And then last, if we do this all right, our agencies are gonna to start to grow. We're gonna start seeing those clients. Uh, one of the things that I, I pride ourselves on as an agency is we've been around for 14 years and we've never marketed once. We've never ran an ad, we've never done a billboard, we've never done any of that. Why? Because we have happy clients. Happy clients lead to more clients because they're gonna go talk to someone else or someone's gonna say, hey, how'd you build that website? That looks awesome. Oh, they built it for us, cool. Now I wanna go hire them or you make that person look like a rock star in their organization, what end, ends up happening, especially in today's day and age, they're gonna get laid off, they're gonna move, they're gonna go somewhere else, and they're gonna go, I need to look like a rock star again at this new place, I'm gonna go bring the old people in, because that's the team that made me look good, right? So, with all that, Thank you for coming. Thank you for staying this late at the conference. Um, if you have any questions, I can take them now. I think we have a minute or two if there's one or two. Um, also, there's um, in the app, you can do session reviews. So please go on there. Um, let me know if you like my cat uh, grabbing a button idea, if I should change that, um, or if there's anything else that you would uh, like to get feedback on. And then most of all, go get involved uh, with the contribution days uh, that's coming up tomorrow. Uh, if you are new to the process or you don't think you have a place in contribution, you do, so come to it and find out how. Uh, and so with that, I think I can take one or two questions. Do I have time? Yeah? All right, are there any questions? Yep. Yeah, uh, thanks, your talk was brilliant. Um, I had lots of questions, but if I can just ask two and then you can use the next one. Yeah. The first question is, um, how do you decide how far to take it? Because there's always like so much further like marketing related decisions, like you're gonna design a car with the website, they're going to share it on social media. Do we include that in the system or not? Because maybe it's outside of the scope. And then the second question is, what's your experience with like, clients actually adopting it and using it themselves <coughs> other than your own team just using it? That's a uh, great question <coughs> in two parts. Um, so the, the first question was, um, where do you draw those lines? That's scope, right? And, and that's purely just, you need, you need to look at the process, look at the client, look at what they want out of this. Uh, one of the best things that I love asking clients is rather than like, here's what I'm gonna do for you, it's like, what do you want me to do? Where do you want to go? Uh, my favorite question is, where do you wanna be in two years? If I ask you where you wanna be in two years, I now know where your milepost is, where your you know, line of success is, and then I'll take you there, right? So from there, I can work back, draw a scope, and then if all of a sudden, like, hey, we totally left out social media um, cards, and we need to have, you know, or, X Twitter changes how they do their um, links now where they don't actually show the link title anymore. We need to do something. We have scope around that and we can change it up. Um, and then implementation, we've done this at larger organizations where we start to implement a design and then all of a sudden other teams are like, ooh, that's fun, I want in on that, right? And so all of a sudden you can start having multiple organizations. Um, we've worked with some, some very large companies that have actually implemented it across multiple, multiple teams and all of a sudden, with more people comes more complexity, so now you have to have a process for how does the design system change? Because if I change that button and I have a cat run out of the side of the screen and grab it, all of a sudden, every app, every website, every you know hardware piece, everything's gonna have cats running around it and maybe they don't want that. So maybe we need to figure out a way to contain the cat just to the web and let everyone else do their thing, right? So it, it can get used and, and you'll start to see other people start to use it as well. Any last questions? Totally fine if not. All right, I appreciate it for all you guys being here. Thank you.